Article 41 of the Constitution. So before proceeding any further, just a few housekeeping matters. We are recording today's event and it will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. So therefore, I would ask that everyone keeps themselves on mute unless you're asking a question. There will be time at the end of the event um, for questions and discussion. So I would ask that you please hold any questions until the end or pop them into the chat for one of my fellow weary committee members to read out at the end. So in addition, um, since we're all aware that referendums can be topics that can elicit strong responses or emotions, um, I just want to make it clear that we absolutely encourage respectful debate today, but any kind of abusive comments or remarks will not be tolerated. So with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Aiden Butler. I'm the interim co-director of Women in Research Ireland, um, otherwise known as WERI. I'd also like to introduce my fellow committee members who are present. Um, so we have Cathy Corcoran, who is a committee member, um, Kira Walsh, our secretary, Arjun Junis, our fellow co my, my fellow co-director, and Suzanne Kyle, who's also a committee member. I'd also just like to let you know a little bit about WERI. So Women in Art Research Ireland is a volunteer-led charity based in Dublin, Ireland, and a group member of the National Women's Council of Ireland. WERI provides a platform for women, non-binary, gender-fluid persons, and members of underrepresented groups working in research and academia. So monthly events afford the opportunity to discuss solutions to problems that affect our work. Weary has been operating since 2017 and became a registered charity in 2019. I'm pleased to follow us on social media to hear more about our events. So now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's first speaker, Associate Professor Laura Cahillan from the School of Law at the University of Limerick. Laura's research interest lies in the area of constitutional law, legal history and judicial studies. She's authored a number of books and has published her research in high-ranking national and international journals. Laura is a frequent contributor to the media on legal and constitutional issues and has advised the Oireachtas on law reform on a number of occasions. Her work has been cited several times in the Dáil and the Shannad by the Irish Superior Courts and UK parliamentary briefings, among others. And Laura is also editor-in-chief of the Irish Judicial Studies Journal. So welcome, Laura. Thank you very much, Aideen. Um, so I'm just going to start by um, sharing my screen with people and hopefully everybody's able to see that there. Um, somebody can give me a nudge if that's not working. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you all today. And um, it's great to have an opportunity to speak about the referendums. Um, I'm going to concentrate on Article 41.2, um, so the care referendum um but if anyone wants to ask questions about the family referendum at, at the end um i'm more than happy to to discuss that as well but i think what, from what i'm seeing so far um a lot of the attention is is focusing on the care referendum and there seems to be quite a lot of confusion around the care referendum um as to what it's going to do and as to what the current provision that's in there actually does as well. Um, so I just thought I would focus on that in particular on the impact of what is there currently um, and on the potential impact of uh, replacing it. So I'm just going to start by looking at the, the current wording that we've in the Constitution because again I think it's really important that people are familiar with what's actually in there because again lots of people seem to think it says something that it doesn't necessarily say. So here is what it does actually say. Um, that the state recognises that by her life within the home, woman gives to the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. The state shall therefore endeavour to ensure that mothers shall not be obliged, but mothers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect uh, of their duties in the home. So uh, that's what it says. And people often ask, um, where did that even come from? Why was that put into the Constitution in the first place? So if we go back to the very beginning, um, the guy in the top right hand corner of the slide there is a guy called John Hearn. And he is the person who wrote our Constitution. So he would have worked very closely with um, with De Valera, but he, he would have been the principal um, legal drafter of the Constitution. And it's very hard to know whether this provision originated with him um, or with 
um, De Valera. Um, it's certainly clear that De Valera felt quite strongly about it. And historians have written about De Valera's own personal situation um, and the fact that his views on women and motherhood um, were influenced by the fact that he was sent home to Ireland to be raised by his grandmother um, while his single mother went out to work in New York. And his, his personal papers show that, you know, he keenly felt the loss of his mother in his life. So, you know, that's potentially an influence, but there are many more influences at play here, apart from De Valera's own personal circumstances. John Hearn was a comparative constitutional scholar and would have been very familiar with the European constitutions of the day. And quite a number of those institution, uh, constitutions had references to protection of maternity. Um, so this, this wasn't a unique thing, this idea in the Irish constitution. There were kind of similar types of provisions in other constitutions. Um, but our one is, is a little bit different um, because you had the particular influence of Catholic social thinking. Now, it is important that we recognize that Ireland at the time was a deeply conservative society. Its values were Catholic and um, patriarchal women were consigned to the role of mothers in the home. And Hearn himself was a devoted uh, Catholic. He had trained as a priest. But you also had the influence of groups like the Jesuits and the guy at the bottom um, corner there, who, Father Charles McQuaid, who later became an archbishop. Um, now, sometimes his influence is overstated. He was not a central drafting figure. He was a family friend of De Valera's and Dev would ask him his opinion from time to time on social matters. Um, but McQuaid did take it upon himself to send in drafts of material for certain parts of the Constitution. And this was one of them. And his influence on this particular provision as opposed to any other part of the constitution, but this one is significant. And he wrote um, what's been referred to as the X draft. And, and I have a little snippet of it um, on the PowerPoint for you there, um, where he has pretty much the exact first sentence that ends up in Article 41.2. And the second sentence there was in Article 45. Um, so it's quite clear that that's, you know, it's very close to the final provision that ended up in the, the Constitution. And it's also clear that it was very influenced by a papal encyclical. So a document uh, coming from the Vatican uh, called Rerum Novarum, which spoke about the nature of a woman being for housework. And, and you know, this is what she was for, was for bringing up her children and uh, and being involved in the family. Um, and McQuaid felt very strongly about this. Um, there were a number of, of protests and complaints from women's groups after the, the wording was published. Um, and, you know, there are exchanges between De Valera and McQuaid where they just they can't understand this. They're saying, you know, this this is a woman's natural sphere. You know, what what else would they expect? Um, so the wording did not go down well. Um, with women's groups. Now, it's worth pointing out that a lot of the opposition would have come from university graduates um, uh, rather than like let's say working class women but there were a number of groups that were actively opposed um, to the wording and when this came up in the Dáil debates um, De Valera seemed to be perplexed uh, he couldn't understand what the problem was um, and he stated that he believed that 99% of the women of the country would, um, would agree with every line of it um, now he was asked a number of times in the Dáil debates um, what, what is this article about? What is it designed to achieve? And how are you actually going to make sure that women are not going to be forced out to work? Um, and he kind of sidestepped those questions a number of times, but eventually he had to kind of give some sort of answer. Um, so first of all, in relation to the mothers and women issue, he kind of says that this is about mothers, you know, mothers in the family who are, are married in the family context, obviously. And secondly, when he was asked, well, how are you going to ensure that that end bit to ensure that that women are not going to be forced to to work if they really want to to stay at home and look after their families? Um, and I'll just read out to you um, what he says. So the, the start of it is on that green bit of the slide here um, where he's saying that, you know, this is the ideal that we sh women shouldn't be compelled to go out. But how the state would do that, we need to leave this open. So he's saying, OK, there is some sort of an intent here, but we're not going to tie the hands of the government in the wording of the Constitution. We want to leave it open. But then he goes on and he says, look, if I was able to organize it, I would try to get 
for the community some immediate return from a man who's getting financial assistance. But if it was a woman, I would quite take the other attitude. A woman by her duties in the home is in fact performing for the community as a whole, a fundamental service and rendering an invaluable service to the state. And I would not require of a mother under these circumstances, any other form of return, such as I would be inclined to demand in the case of a man. So that does suggest that maybe there was some sort of economic right envisaged on this, but certainly there was a reluctance to tie the hands of the executive. So the wording of the constitution does not actually set down any financial obligation, but there was kind of this belief behind it that the state would then go on and provide some sort of economic um, support for women. Um, but obviously it didn't. It, it never did that. So this constitutional provision, it certainly intended to be an expression of the current prevailing attitudes and obviously the ideal scenario based on Catholic social teaching. Um, clearly there may have been some intention to provide some sort of financial supports in the future, but that was never acted upon. And the wording doesn't create any obligation that the state would have to act on it. So, I mean, later on, you had societal changes where, you know, feminist movements and so on. And, and there were improvements in the lives of women. But this particular provision was not part of that change. So that leads us then to ask, well, what is the point of this article? What is it good for? And apologies for the little musical interlude, but this really sums it up for me. Oh, it's gone back. I can't. Oh, there he is. Uh, so I think it's worth focusing on the fact that this provision has done nothing for women because there is a lot of confusion about what, what's going to happen if we take it out. Um, and that's why it's important that we get the message out there, I think, that actually it hasn't actually done anything positive. It hasn't had any legal, positive legal impact for women. And in order to prove that, I'm just gonna do a really quick um, example of a few cases where this has come up in the courts. And don't worry, I'm not going to get into any of the details, but this is just to show you the attitude that the courts have taken to this provision, because that's really important in order to demonstrate how little use it has been to women. Um, so a good case to, uh, give that example is de Burka versus the Attorney General. Now, this was a case which challenged the law, which had effectively excluded women from juries. And uh, the law was declared unconstitutional, so they won their case. The result was a massive win for the women of Ireland. Um, but the Chief Justice in that case, um, Chief Justice O'Higgins, he disagreed. So he was in the minority in that case. And he actually interpreted women's exclusion from juries as being a benefit on women um, because he said that their exclusion was almost mandatory under Article 41.2 because he said there, the idea is that women will be at home. So if they're being forced to serve on juries, that will take them away from their duties in the home. So that's just one example of how this provision has been given a kind of a strange reading in the courts. And then Dennehy and Loud are two equality cases where the provision was actually used to justify discrimination against men, whereby you had social welfare payments which were only given to women. And when it was challenged as to why they were not also given to men in the same circumstance, um, the answer was that, well, Article 41.2 allows for preferential treatment of women, essentially. Um, that argument was tried out in TOG versus Attorney General in relation to discrimination against men in the context of adoption. But on that occasion, the, um, the argument did not succeed. But here is the really big case. Um, in the late 1980s, this case was heard um, and this really had the potential to actually to change everything. Um, because this was the first case that was really looking at Article 41.2 itself. Um, and the effect that it could have. And had um, this case succeeded, there could actually have been some sort of positive benefit coming out of the article. Um, but unfortunately, the case didn't succeed. So the case L versus L was um, a, a judicial separation case, a family separation. This was before we had divorce, obviously. 
And I won't get into the complicated legal rules here, but we didn't have joint ownership in the family home. So the, the home was in the name of the man, as was almost always the case. But there was a rule in law that if a woman had contributed to, let's say, the mortgage payments or contributed originally to the price of the house, that she could gain a beneficial interest in the home. And unfortunately for Mrs. L in this case, she was a housewife. She didn't have any independent means, so she hadn't been able to make any of those contributions. And Miss Justice Catherine McGuinness, uh, who was then at the time uh, senior counsel in this case, she made the argument that it makes no sense that the Constitution prizes the housewife. And yet our current legal framework at the time was disadvantaging the housewife in that a woman who was working outside the home, who was earning her own money, could then contribute to the mortgage payments and could gain a beneficial interest in the family home. Whereas the person performing the constitutionally preferable role of wife and mother had no way of possibly contributing financially and therefore had no way of, of gaining this beneficial interest. And Mr. Justice Barr in the High Court recognised the fact that this situation was ridiculous. The Constitution is telling us how amazing a woman and a mother is and how important they are for the common good and yet our laws are disadvantaging them and so he declared that this was unconstitutional but when this was um appealed to the supreme court uh the supreme court reversed um the high court's judgment in a very strong judgment where they criticized uh the high court judge for overstepping his role uh saying that he was trying to create new rights which didn't actually exist in the constitution um and because that judgment is so strong it, it effectively rendered article 41.2 meaningless because the court was essentially saying no you can't derive any rights from this provision and really we've never had any litigation directly on the issue of article 41 1.2 since then. Now there have been one or two cases where the article has cropped up in various different circumstances but again it's never led to anything. So in the Senate case Ms Justice Denham tried to explain to people that article 41.2 was not about assigning women to a domestic role that it was about recognizing women but again that case did not lead to anything as a result of this recognition so there was no sort of economic or financial gains to be attached to it. Um, in T versus T, Mr. Justice Murray tried to give it an updated reading and, and said that, you know, in this context, we should be talking about parents and not mothers. Um, but again, it, it's pretty hard to separate the, the kind of gendered history of the provision um, and the wording. So, you know, I, I don't think that idea really ever caught on in relation to um, Article 41.2. So to sum up then, like this, it, when we look at the case law and when we look at what the courts have told us that this article does and doesn't do, we can draw these conclusions from it. Um, first of all, there is no right to remain in the home that, that comes from that article. There is no such thing as a right of a woman to remain in the home. Um, that article doesn't provide anything in that regard. There's certainly no right to economic support. And the courts have made that one very clear. And it appears, again, from the, um, the interpretation given to us by the courts, it appears there are no legal rights arising from that article at all. Um, and just very recently in the O'Mara decision, um, Mr. Justice O'Donnell pointed out that it's questionable as to whether this provision even covers unmarried women or women who are not mothers. Um, so again, this just underlines that the current provision has done nothing for women or mothers or carers more generally and so that has led them to a number of different groups um considering this provision and you can see there's there's been quite a lot of research done on reforming this provision already and that, that's why it it does surprise me sometimes when people are kind of saying well we've never considered this before why the rush to do this and um, this has been going on for over 50 years there's been loads and loads of reports and recommendations on this the problem is there's never been a consensus on whether we should get rid of it or replace it with something now what there has never been is a suggestion that we keep it um, which again, I'm kind of surprised that there are there, there is such a movement at the moment that seems to be saying we should keep this as it is. It's doing something important because in all the reports and recommendations that have ever considered this, that has never been a conclusion. Um, it's always been deleted or replace it in some form. 
And all of that led in 2018 to a proposal that we delete it. Um, and that was a going to go to referendum, but the National Women's Council of Ireland, a couple of other groups objected to that saying, look, we haven't really had a discussion around re replacing it. Um, how can you just you know, jump straight to, to deleting it? And so that is why the Citizens' Assembly on gender equality was set up. Now, their remit was a little bit wider than that in the end. They considered other things. But the reason they were set up in the first place was to actually consider the fate of Article 41.2. So they were then asked, do you want to delete this article or do you want to replace it with something? And having heard from experts in various different care organizations and loads of other groups, they decided they wanted to replace it and not just delete it, but not only replace it. Um, they felt that there would be little point in a symbolic replacement. They wanted a replacement which would actually be meaningful um, for, for care, for people involved in care. Um, and that came across very strongly and had an overwhelming amount of support um, from the citizens, which is rather unusual, actually, to, to get, you know, 100 citizens from a cross section of society to have such support amongst them for, for a provision like this. And what they recommended in terms of wording to replace what we have is that we again recognize that home and family life gives to society a support without which the common good cannot be achieved, but that the state shall take reasonable measures to support care within the home and the wider community. Now, I'm biased because I was involved in this wording, but I think this would have been the optimum position that we could have been given because there is a recognition of the importance of care. Um, there is also a clear obligation that the state has a duty to ensure reasonable measures to support care. But the beauty of it is that it, it wouldn't have actually forced the state to spend any money necessarily um, because the state could argue that they're already taking reasonable measures. It would be up to the courts on a case by case basis in individual circumstances to say, you know, this isn't reasonable or you haven't actually fulfilled your duty in this context. Um, so that, that would have been the optimum wording. The Joint Oireachtas Committee on Gender Equality, which was a cross party political party body as well, also endorsed that wording. Um, and myself and Rachel were at an event there before Christmas where we were being very enthusiastic and positive and hopeful that that was the wording that we would be given. But unfortunately, that has not been the case. So here's what we are actually being given and, and what we're being asked to vote on in a few weeks time. And it's that the state recognises that the provision of care by members of a family to one another by reason of the bonds that exist among them gives to society a support without which the common good cannot be achieved and shall strive to support such provision. So you're, you're maintaining the recognition of care, you're widening it out so it's not just about women, but it's about care in the family context. Um, and you're repeating that same idea that the state will endeavour to support. Uh, instead, you're saying that the state shall strive to support, which is basically a synonym of the same wording that was already there. So that's the wording we're being given. So we then need to ask, well, what's that going to do? If that's actually passed, what, what is that going to achieve? And the first important point to make about that is it's not going to remove any rights, any recognitions, or take anything away. And I think it's important to reassure people about that because there is a narrative out there that we're removing women from the constitution. And that's not true because the wording that's there is actually widening the definition of care. So women and mothers are being included within that definition. You're not actually taking any recognition away from them. You're just including men, anyone within in the family context within that definition. And also, I mean, if you want to be really literal about it, the word woman still appears in the Constitution in Article 45. You have equality articles in Article 16, Article 40. Nothing is being taken away because, again, you can't lose what you never had. There were never any rights for women in that article anyway. So we're not losing anything. So that's important. Um, but the other point is that it's not very likely that it's actually going to create any new obligations uh, or any rights. Um, now, one or two things that have been noted about it is that, first of all, it only recognises care in the family context. Um, the Citizens' Assembly would have recognised care in a wider context. 
Um, and also FLAC in particular are making the argument that persons with disabilities are not recognised and they're arguing that it's potentially problematic again and that care is only recognised in that familial context rather than care more generally. Um, now what it is doing is that it's removing the gendered language that we currently have in our constitution and it's removing the implication that women as opposed to men have duties that they are required to attend to in the home. Um, because again, you know, you can say what, what the constitution says and doesn't say. It doesn't say a woman's place is in the home, but it says that women have duties in the home. Uh, and it doesn't say anything about men having duties in the home. So I think it is really important, even if it's just for that reason alone, that we, we get rid of that language that's currently in the constitution, telling us that women specifically have duties in the home that they are required to attend to. Um, but I guess the bottom line on this is actually that it's unlikely to do anything. In the same way that our current wording has not done anything, it has not had any legal effect, it has not had any impact on women, it has not given any rights to women. This is also not likely to create any rights or to, to give any duties um, on the state. Now, Minister O'Gorman is going around saying that this is creating a new legal duty on the state. Um, and I can't see where he's getting that from, because the wording that we had was that the state will uh, endeavour, shall endeavour to support. The wording that will be given is the state shall strive to support. They, they mean the same thing. It just means they have to try to do something. That's not a legally enforceable obligation. Um, so, uh, you know, it's hard to see how he's making that argument. Um, is there any hope at all that it will do anything? Um, the answer to that is it's very, very, very unlikely um, that it will do anything. The only kind of slight argument that you could make is actually based on those statements that the minister is making and, and government is making, because the courts in, in recent cases, they've placed a lot of emphasis on what the people understand an amendment to mean. Um, and so if you can show that when the people, let's say if the people approve this amendment, if you can show that by approving this amendment, the people understood that they were actually putting in a new obligation into the constitution, um, based on what the government is saying, they're, they're saying this is a new duty, this is a new obligation on the state. So if you could somehow demonstrate that the people believed there was going to be a new obligation on the state, then you might have some success in terms of saying that this does create something new. But even then, it's not going to lead to any sort of concrete economic rights because the courts aren't going to discover any concrete rights in that wording. If, you know, unless there's explicit wording in there, um, the courts can't because it's a breach of the separation of powers if they try to get into the area that the executive is responsible for, which is a control of the public money. Um, and so I suppose at the end of the day, my message on this is that I suppose I am an unenthusiastic yes voter on this because I think it's useful to get rid of the language that's in there. I'm disappointed it's not going further. I would have liked to see this going further to actually work for, for women, for those who care in the home to provide something positive. Um, but really this is just a makeover. Um, I, I think it's really important that we do focus on the fact that the current provision has not done anything. It has not worked. So we're not going to lose anything by replacing it. It's a pity we're not replacing it with something better. Um, but this is still an improvement on what's there. And people might ask, why should I care about this? If it doesn't do anything, what's the point? Um, and I still think that this is a, our constitution is something that is supposed to reflect our society of today. And if you have a constitution that has that implication in there that women are responsible for the domestic role, but not men, well, I don't think that's very suitable to have in our constitution. So for that reason alone, I think this is worth replacing. And I haven't timed myself. So I'm sorry, Aideen, if I've gone well over time on this. I do tend to just keep talking. But again, I'm happy to take um, questions on this or on the, the family one as well, if, if that's helpful. Thank you so much, Laura, for that um, very passionate presentation. Um, I certainly really enjoyed it. And I'm sure everyone else did. Um, 
I think I was particularly struck by your message about the current provision having done, well, essentially next to nothing for women. Um, and I think that is a very important message to um to, to share. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions for you. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that you can hold your questions until the end, or you can pop them into the chat for my fellow committee members to read out later. So now I would like to introduce our second speaker, um, Rachel Coyle, who is Head of Campaigns and Mobilisation at the National Women's Council. Rachel is a trade unionist, a community and political activist, and has over seven years experience in inspiring activism and campaigns. So the NWC are campaigning for a yes, yes vote, and it will be interesting to hear from Rachel um, the issues at NWC with the present wording and their reasons for supporting the proposed changes. So welcome, Rachel. Thanks very much, and um, you know, thanks for for coming out to to talk to us. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna kind of speak to a presentation, a very short <clears throat> presentation, um, and then I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I have to say, I'm I'm a campaigner, so I uh, am gonna kind of take a different approach than Laura. Um, I do have enthusiasm for this campaign, and hopefully by the end of this discussion, you will too. Um, but here we go. Let me just share this. Can you see that okay? That's great. Um, yeah, so th again, yeah, thanks a lot for um, inviting the National Women's Council to come and talk <clears throat> about these two important referendums on the 8th of March. Um, we are supporting a yes, yes vote uh, for family, for care, for women and for equality. These referendums are very long overdue. It's been a long road to get here, 87 years, in fact. Um, and I suppose just to, you know, I suppose in response maybe to, to Laura there, you know, like how we run this campaign is actually as important um, as why we're doing it. Uh, popularizing these issues. We'll never have this opportunity again, or it might be a generation before we have this opportunity again. So and certain those values, um, is really important and language is really really important like Bunuk Nahern it's a statement that values as a country it sets important societal expectations that reflect on all of us and uh, just as our country reflects our constitution our constitution needs to reflect all its people like we can have a, a constitution that recognizes the care that women have traditionally provided on our own at home it recognizes the family care of women and men today and into the future we can have a constitution that finally gives equality to all unmarried families <laughs> and Ireland's children that are born outside of marriage. And I'm going to speak a little bit uh, about the, the two referendums, the, the care referendum and the family one. So um, let me see. So, yeah, basically, what, what are the referendums? What was going to take place on Friday the 8th of March? There's going to be one on family and one on care. So to speak to the family referendum in terms of what's being proposed, so the the first this this referendum is um, going to expand the constitutional definition of the family beyond the marital family, and uh, so it's going to be defining family as whether founded on marriage or other durable relationships. And you know, if the referendum passes, <clears throat> you know, it'll also recognize. Sorry, it'll also take out the text in Article Forty One uh, Three that says. Um, you know, that the state pledges to uh, guard with special care the institution of marriage, and it just kind of takes out on which the family is founded. So what it's doing is removing the link between family and marriage. And this is really important to do because um, we need, I suppose, we, we need the constitution to reflect the reality of families that, that um, you know, call Ireland home. Um, it's not in any way, you know, diminishing the, the the institution of marriage. You know, we always say rights aren't a pie. Uh, giving more rights to uh, some doesn't take rights away from others. So marriage is going to continue to be protected, um, but it just means that those families that aren't recognized. So you know, one parent families, cohabiting couples. Um, you know, those families where children are cared for by their grandparents or another relative for whatever reason. Um, it's just vitally important that the Constitution protects, recognizes all of these children, um, you know, 
we know that 40% of the children born in Ireland last year were born into unmarried families. So, uh, you know, our constitution needs to cherish and protect all these children equally, not just those um, founded on marriage, because they're no less than, because, you know, you know yourself, you, you know who these families are. I'm one of those families and my son is, you know, should be no less protected than those uh, children whose parents are married. <clears throat> so in terms of the care referendum, um, this is proposing to remove Article 41.2, which Laura just spoke about, the one that's kind of commonly referred to as women in the home, um, and it's going to replace it with a new gender neutral article that recognizes the value of care within families. And, um, you know, that wording Laura spoke through really well. So I'm just gonna maybe talk a little bit about why in the National Women's Council, we're advocating a yes vote um, a bit more enthusiastically. <laughs> so um, this referendum obviously is gonna remove the article 41.2 that we know has really outdated sexist language that limits women to a life within the home. Um, and we know that women protested this language in 1937. Uh, we know it was done at a time when women's rights were under attack by conservative and religious forces in this state and right across Europe. Um, you know, again, Laura spoke about the, the jury bar, marriage bar. Um, these sorts of policies were copper fastened by putting this wording into our foundational document. And um, the wording never reflect the reality of women's lives and our contribution to so many areas of society and community, including, but not limited to care within the home. Um, and for me in particular, like these terms, duties uh, and neglect, they sit really uncomfortably with me uh, and the women that I speak to. So I'd love to hear from some of you as to like the impact of this article uh, in your own life. And it, in fact, when, it, when I talk to people who obviously yeah, I mean, who's no offense, Laura, you know, who sits around reading the Constitution? They don't know that this even is there and they're surprised. So, you know, it's really good that we're finally having like a, a national conversation about this. Um, and as Laura very rightly pointed out, it the article never resulted in the state valuing the unpaid care work done by women. And um, it saw no role for men in contributing to care and resulted really, I think, in the in the state ignoring the work that's done by women, taking us for granted, trying to make us invisible. And I think we can all argue that it, that was just a blatant failure because the women uh, in this country have been fighting back for 87 years. A woman's place is wherever she wants it to be and it's time to regulate Article 41.2 to the history bin. We know men in increasing numbers are providing care. Men have strong and caring relationships with children, parents and others around them. And we should be welcoming this, encouraging this, valuing this, Men should play an equal role in caring and looking after their families and home. It's okay if they want to stay at home and look after their children. It's acceptable for them to ask for flexibility from their employer to help care for an aging parent. Um, it should be normal that the crash rings my partner rather than me uh, when my son isn't feeling well, do you know? And um, like, there's no doubt that women obviously do more caring work than men. 90% uh, of those who listed their sort of, um, you know, principal economic status in the recent census as looking after um, home or family. 90% of those people were women. And, um, you know, going by statistics, and I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody here, but like on average, women spend double the amount of time as men on caring and more than twice as much time on housework. Uh, the This, this gender gap it exists even among those couples where men and women are both in full-time um, paid work. So this, yeah, like this is an opportunity, I suppose, um, to, to finally kind of recognize the fact that the ongoing and unpaid work that goes on in the home is fundamental to the functioning of our economy, to our society. Um, I really do see the campaign as an opportunity to um, amplify the voices uh, of carers, of, of women, uh, of families, uh, and to speak to the many, many struggles and the hoops that people have to kind of navigate in accessing support. Um, and to talk about the, the total lack of support, let's face it, for parents and caregivers. Um, so yeah, for us, a yes vote, it sends a really clear message to the government that Irish people want to see a change, and a, a change that recognizes that not only are we a caring society, but that we actually support care. Um, so the referendum is a key point um, in time to affect change, but 
the months and the years after that will be just as critical. And in the Women's Council, uh, among you know many others, like we're going to be calling on in this campaign and beyond on all political parties um, to commit to real change. Uh, and that includes things like public childcare um, that provides universal and affordable early years education for every child, a universal social care and support system that provides rights to care and support and properly meets the needs of older and disabled people to make choices and live independent lives, a universal pension so everyone has dignity um, and income adequacy in their older age, regardless of whether they have taken time out of work to care for others, um, and better paid and longer family lead, leave and en entitlements. <clears throat> Sorry. So yeah, um, you know why we're, we're voting yes. Um, so to us, the referendums, they're extremely important. The next five weeks, we're looking forward to talking to all voters, to hearing women and men share their experiences and their support for this change. Uh, we're excited to have a national conversation about the importance of care in our society, um, of being inclusive of all families and all the diversity. Voting yes means a recognition that every woman's place is wherever she wants it to be and that anything less is just unacceptable in our constitution. Voting yes means that we cherish the wide diversity of families and every child will be recognized equally as part of a family. Voting yes sends a message that Ireland's a country with care and caring at its heart, that Irish people value care, that will support women, men, families to do so. We know families can't do it alone um, and that care and support needs can't be met by families in isolation. We will use this as a platform to <clears throat> This would make that that very obvious, amplify the very obvious link um, between unpaid care at the at home and the paid care that supports that. Um, because you're right, Laura, that is something that has been missing in this wording. Um, and voting yes tells government and all political parties that Irish people expect these referendums to be followed by real improvements in policy and legislation and investment. So people can make real choices with regards to things like childcare, care uh, for family members, supports for disabled people to live independent lives <clears throat> with autonomy and choice. So for us, referendums, these two referendums are just a first step towards real material change. But it's really important that we take that step. Um, so yeah, we need to shape the referendum campaign to be positive, inclusive, respectful, and actually shares the lived experience of women and families. Um, we are encouraged by recent polls, but we know that we can't be complacent. Um, you know, the fact that there's two referendums, the fact that there's a lot of disinformation out there, we can't be complacent. Uh, we know that every conversation between now and the 8th of March could make a difference. And we know that every single vote will count. Um, so we would love to see you and your members kind of be part of the campaign, help us to, to shape it, to be that respectful, um, positive and inclusive space for people. Um, and, you know, do you can do this by joining our um, Canvas teams. You can talk to your friends and family, post on social media. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot. Um, really looking forward to the discussion and looking forward to a positive yes, yes campaign. Thanks a million, Rachel, for that talk. And I suppose um, just to acknowledge the work of the Women's Council in bringing us to this point, um, I think we could see from both presentations it's been a long time coming. So um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions if anyone would like to ask a question. I might um, get the ball rolling myself just while people are gathering their thoughts. Um, so my first question um, would actually be for Laura. So Laura, I suppose you focused on um, Article 41.2 there, kind of that it may not have practical effects, but possibly more of a symbolic effect, I suppose, at this stage anyway. With regards to the other referendum, do you think there could be practical effects arising from that change? Absolutely. Yeah. So. I think the, the family referendum is actually much more straightforward because our current constitution recognizes only the family based on marriage. 
And that means the state is allowed to discriminate against families not based on marriage. And we've seen that in a lot of like lawyers will tell you that 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 has practical consequences for real people. We saw it in the O'Mara judgment only very recently where they had to go to court um, to, to get a contributory pension just because they happened not to be married, even though they were living in the same situation as, as a marital family and there were dependent children and so on. And look, legislation for the most part has actually made sure that in most circumstances, people who are not married are in the same um. I suppose, standard legally as people who are married. But there are still areas where marital families are discriminated against and they're allowed to do that because our constitution tells us that the family is based on marriage. Um, so taking that out, taking out that, that line that on which the family is founded, linking marriage to the family, that is really key in order to ensure that we won't have this discrimination and the state isn't allowed to discriminate against certain forms of family. And I know people are a bit worried about the durable relationships wording. And when I saw it first, I was kind of going, why have they put that in there? But the bottom line again on this is that the courts will interpret durable wording on the basis of what the Oireachtas feels that a family should be. So it, it's the Oireachtas which actually um, decides on policy, on what a family should be, what a durable relationship is. And the courts then will take the policy from the Oireachtas and that's how they will interpret it. So I think, you know, there's people going around saying, we don't know what the courts will do. They could say anything is a family and, you know, troubles, they can be durable. That's just not going to happen because the courts will have to take their lead from the Oireachtas. Now, if the Oireachtas wanted to go down the line of, you know, polygamy and the rest of it, um, who knows what might happen but that in itself is obviously very unlikely as well so I think there's been a gross exaggeration um in terms of maybe fear-mongering about what durable relationships will do um when in reality it's it's just going to lead to the situation that we have in ECHR law so the law of the European Convention on Human Rights where the state looks at what um or rather the court looks at what is a de facto family and they make decisions on a case-by-case basis as to whether this particular scenario should constitute a family. Um, so um, I think that one is very straightforward, first of all, it's, it's per, you know, it is clear cut and it definitely will have a real world impact for families who are currently being discriminated against simply because the couple are not married. Excellent. Thanks very much, Laura. That was a great um, answer. Um, I can see that there's questions rolling in on the chat there, so I might ask my um, committee members if they want to um, pick up some of those questions. Yeah, there's a, a question here from Tara. She says, what is the main legitimate argument and to not misinformation for a no vote? A little bit quite clear, I think maybe it's just the speaker. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the main legitimate argument for a no vote? Um, yeah, I mean, if you want me to <laughs> take that one, um, but it's kind of worth, you know, what is the main legitimate argument? Uh, like, to be honest, none of the arguments that I have heard uh, actually are, are stacking up. Um, so I would, yeah, if it's okay, I might, <laughs> I might just deflect a little bit and say, um, there's so much more positive in this. Uh, and we, we need to just continue to amplify that message rather than kind of being pulled down I mean, to be honest, like I have seen um, the issue either being misrepresented, um, I, I would say deliberately by people who have a, a, a sort of anti-rights agenda. Uh, and we have witnessed this in the National Women's Council quite a bit. We've been targeted a lot online. Um, so yeah, like the things that you might hear are, you know, erasing women from the constitution. Well, as Laura says, that's actually just not true. There's other, you know, if you want to be technical about it, uh, that's not true. Um, but like our response is we're trying to erase the limits that have been placed on women in the constitution in article 41.2. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Laura, if you have any others. Yeah, I mean, there there's probably a small sector of no voters who, maybe are voting no as a protest vote because the the care amendment certainly is not going far enough 
And I know I have spoken to some advocacy organisations who really haven't decided whether they're voting yes or no, because they would like to vote no if they felt it would actually lead to more change. But it's very unlikely that it will lead to more change. Like it's like Rachel said, this is our only opportunity probably to do this now. Um, so, I mean, there are, you know, a certain amount of people kind of saying this hasn't gone far enough and maybe we should be voting no to send that message. Um, and then most of the other no voters, I think, are people who honestly misunderstand the current context and feel that there is something positive about having the word women in the constitution and they think that by taking it out that we're losing something so i mean that's the group i'd like to reach to try and explain to them that that's not the case you're not you're not currently getting anything out of what's in there um but then on the on the family one i think there are people who are concerned again people who are honestly concerned about this First of all, the impact that it would have on marriage, that it would somehow devalue marriage, which it doesn't. It, again, it retains a, a special recognition for marriage in the Constitution. Um, but also they're worried about what sort of family relationships will be recognised. But again, like I've explained, the courts will have to take their lead on this from the Oireachtas. So there, I mean, there's very little... In reality, there's very little possibility of anything going wrong on that. Um, but I mean, there are people on the no side who honestly believe those positions it's, it's not all scaremongering but I certainly a lot of it is yeah and just to say yeah voting no doesn't get you more progressive wording unfortunately and voting no isn't really uh you know a slap to government if that's you know the intention this is something that's going into our foundational documents so this government is mandated by it but all governments going forward are as well so that's why I was saying how we run this campaign, the issues that we popularize, which, by the way, without this referendum campaign, we wouldn't have that scope. You know, like we know that there are local and European elections in June. We know that at the very latest February of next year, there will be a general election. So you can see how we use this as a platform to really, as I say, popularize those issues around the care supports that people so badly need. Great, thanks a million. Um, are there any other questions there? Thank you, Laura. And yeah, Rachel, we have our next question from Lisa, um, who would like to know if voting yes in the family referendum um, would offer more recognition to LGBT uh, couples um, or single parent families. I think the, the simple answer, answer is yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely, because LGBT couples are currently not considered a family under the Constitution and neither are single parent families. They're not actually considered a family under the Constitution, whereas this would allow them to be considered a family. Thank you. OK, is there any more questions? We have a follow up from Tara um, uh, on discrimination on married or not married home care tax credit uh, can only be claimed by married people. Um, any thoughts on that uh, um, observation? Yeah, I mean, when you look at the social kind of protection system that we have, um, you know, there's any number of areas where people are experiencing discrimination over this. Um, so yeah, again, we see this as an opportunity to highlight that type that discrimination uh, and to kind of campaign to change that yeah exactly because again the the current situation the constitution allows the state to positively discriminate in favor of marriage and to discriminate against unmarried families so if if we change that then the state they, they can still prioritize marriage in certain areas but there has to be a legitimate um reason for it so if there's any difference in treatment between married and unmarried families if we approve this referendum, the state will have to explain why there is a difference in treatment and why it is a legitimate uh, difference in treatment, which makes it very difficult then to discriminate against um, the non-marital family. Thank Great. You. Thanks very much, Laura and Rachel. Um, are there any final questions there? Uh, yeah, we have another question here from Breege. So she asks, do you think that universal basic income would support the unpaid work of caring and housework in the home? Um, yeah, well, I can say a little bit about that. Um, I mean, I'm a 
trade unionist. So I have to say, you know, the the idea of universal basic income, you know, sometimes doesn't sit great with me. Um, but I think moving maybe beyond that into, and there is lots of talk at the moment around a participation income, um, that that is much more of like an empowering, um, you know, process uh, that if, when you're calling it an, an income, um, I suppose it, it shifts us away from the, you know, the, the means testing, the kind of nastiness that's built into our social welfare system, I, you know, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, it would certainly support that. Um, Part of, you know, I, I'm calling it a participation income rather than um, UBI. Um, but yeah, like we, I suppose as part of this this conversation, driving this conversation, popularizing these ideas. I mean, for me, I would have thought COVID, you know, should have been the catalyst to, to be having this. Um, but it seems that our policymakers want to go back to business as usual. Um, and in the Women's Council, anyway, we're not going to let that be the case. We're going to continue to kind of advocate for these things. Um, but ultimately, it's about, yeah, actually supporting people to make choices. The thing, you know, like in terms of their own circumstances, looking after their own families um, and how that that can be. Yeah, sorry, I'm rabbiting, but it's about support. Yeah, I suppose breed, yes, is the simple answer. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Okay. Um, is there any final, yeah, just, one final question, I think? Yeah, just uh, this is probably a nice one to end on. Uh, from Jennifer, is there any way to get involved in campaigns for the S votes? Absolutely. Yes, Jennifer, that's what I like to hear. Um, <laughs> So in the Women's Council, we are actually running Canvas training online every Tuesday. Um, so that's, you know, the the fun, so all experience and none is welcome. Uh, it talks through the kind of the key messages and then just the fundamentals of how to Canvas. And Canvas can be like door to door or it can be just having the conversation in your workplace. Um, but we are developing local campaign groups, Jennifer. So if you're interested in being linked with that, you know, do get in touch with me. Let me know where you are in the country and we'll make sure that um, you're, you're linked in there. Excellent. Thank you to both of our speakers so much for such an informative session. Um, I have to say personally, it's made me feel much more comfortable with the proposed amendments and um, kind of clearer on what, what, what they'll mean, mean. So I just really want to say thank you to both of you for that. Um, and with that, we might end the session. Thank you all. Thanks, Maya.